All right, good afternoon, everyone. We will go ahead and call the order at noon. Uh, uh, just a reminder, this uh, meeting is being recorded. Everything said during the meeting and uh, is shared in the chat or in the video will be part of the meeting recording that is shared with your website. If you're joining my phone, it is start at uh, click on uh, yourself. Uh, Shelly, if we can go for the student roll call, please. Amber Wright. Dan Bate. Broncos out. Dan, if you're on, Dan, you're on the phone. Thank you, Dan. Frank Walter. Here. Gail Bradley. Present. Eve Godfinger. Jason Johnson. Here. Joshua Gaither. I'm here. Uh, Ely Augenstein. Present. Kevin Foster. Up seven, we have forum. All right, that is our fastest form that we have met today. So, thank you, everyone. All right, so we will start with the chair report. Uh, the attendance report is in your package. Just a reminder if you missed two or more consecutive meetings, uh, the bureau staff will reach out to you to see if you're still interested in serving on the committee. Uh, we currently have two vacancies. Uh, the first is for a physician who specializes in severe to head injury treatment or spinal cord care. And the second is emergency physician serving as EMS counsel for the Western region. Uh, if you have submitted an application to the governor's office and are waiting to hear back, uh, you can touch uh, face of Shelly. She may be able to get more information, uh, but those appointments are uh, up to the governor's office for determination. I just want to briefly cover the naloxone leave behind program. Uh, we are live. Uh, we are really excited to have some agencies that have already sent their kits out in the community. Uh, I packed it away, but this is my little sh uh, show and tell kit uh, that are ready. This is what the kits look like that EMS agencies are giving out. Uh, so thank you for everyone who has uh, expressed interest in that. Uh, our point of contact, uh, Julia will sit in the chat if you're interested in participating in naloxone leave behind. Uh, will be uh, Julie Benton or Adam Rodriguez. Uh, either one of them can help give you additional information uh, regarding that program. Uh, next up in the packet is our 2024 meeting schedule. Uh, we do our best to make sure we avoid any major holidays or big conferences. Uh, we do recognize that there are a large number of conferences, both the EMS and common community, but hopefully we have not overlapped any of those. If you see any significant conflict, please let Shelly know. We if the schedule could be adjusted. Otherwise, this will be the meeting schedule for 2024, so you can make plans on your schedule as indicated. And next for general report, I will go ahead and hand it over to Chief Garcia. Good afternoon, Dr. Bradley and Medical Direction Commission. Uh, we have a slide deck that we have gone through a couple times today, and in the interest of time, um, we can just skip ahead to Suicide Prevention Month, Shelly, if you don't mind. Um, September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. For those of you that were able to join the special presentation provided by Solari during EMS Council today, um, we did learn quite a bit about 988 resources available within the state. Um, certainly the goal here in Arizona is to reduce the number of suicides to zero moving forward. We want to make sure, especially during the month of September, that we continue to promote resources to folks. Um, we learned today that you can call 988 from anywhere. You can also text 988. And so we will keep uh, sharing information and resources here. Um, we are also preparing for Crash Responder Safety Week in November. Um, today, we were very fortunate to have a presentation on the 2023 Annual Trauma Report. And it certainly demonstrates that the EMS and trauma system plays a significant role in a safe system approach moving forward and um, really making sure we're reducing crashes um, and, and doing injury prevention as it relates to motor vehicle accidents moving forward. Uh, we have a couple work groups going that we will continue through the end of the month um, to be able to provide uh, recommendations on crash responder safety and some messaging coming up in November. Uh, the other Bureau report updates that we had on here were um, related to SHARE and our data dashboard. Uh, can I ask, Julia, do you have a, a quick SHARE update? And then I'll turn it back to Dr. Bradley. Uh, yeah, not too much of an update beyond what's on the slide here. We are 
still in the um, transition process of migrating the databases from the University of Arizona to EDHS. Um, EDHS um, and the Bureau have taken over all communication with the cardiac receiving center that are referral centers for data submission. So um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us and please also forgive us if we um, if you're experiencing any delays in response as we figure out um, some of the answers to different questions and um, that's Thank you. And we do have a shared user group that will be meeting November 8th as well. So we'll make sure that communication goes out to anyone who's interested in participating in that. Uh, next, just a very brief update. Uh, for those of you that were on staff this morning, uh, Vossel shared a really nice uh, dashboard along with our executive summary for the uh, staff annual uh, trauma report. This will be our format moving forward. Uh, we do have a few edits that we will make uh, before that goes uh, to the director's office for final review. We anticipate that that will be ready for uh, public uh, publication on October 1st. Uh, and once that is live, we will reach out to the states. You will get messaging uh, to review that uh, dashboard. Uh, the dashboard is really a significant improvement. I, I know Vossel has shared a number of her EMS dashboards. Uh, this is really taking the information that was previously in our PDF uh, trauma report. It is now in a Catalog dashboard that is public facing that anyone can uh, access that dashboard. You can adjust things based on your uh, age groups, uh, different uh, variables and get a significant amount of data. So we had wonderful feedback from staff and wanted to make sure that this group was aware of that as well. Uh, before we move to the standing committee reports, we just wanted to uh, welcome two new staff members as well. Uh, the first is Erin Henderson, who is joining us as a paralegal uh, project specialist. Welcome, Erin. And Mary L. Mungie, who's also uh, joining us as an epidemiologist along with the Bureau. So welcome both of you, and thank you for joining us today. All right. Uh, next, I will go to our standing committee report. Uh, Dr. Augenstein, do you have a CHEPI report? Sure. Uh, Noreen explains survey and step prior to official RFP process, and Julie explained next steps for workforce needs, surveys, and strategic plannings. As you noted, Vatsal displayed updated dashboard info, and then Dr. Bradley gave share updates. Uh, the share user group will be November 8th at 2 p.m. The bylaws were approved as amended, and Rachel showed slides for rulemaking progress and next steps. And that was it for Tepi. Thank you. Uh, next one, Dr. Johnson for education. Um, the meeting that Julia ex uh, explained the next step is workforce and then it proved uh, a work group for fall prevention, which was held on September 14th with the fall of one to be determined. Uh, the bylaws were also approved as amended and then the approved work group for PT training for August 29th and one for PT airway 20th on the 30th. And then Rachel had the slides for rolling progress in the next step. Right. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Gaither for PMDs. Uh, good morning, everyone. The PMD update. Uh, the minutes were reviewed, reviewed and approved. Excuse me. Uh, as we are going to discuss in length further, uh, we did discuss several additions to Table Three, the interfacility transport list. Uh, there were two that did not pass, uh, adding antifungals and adding antivirals. There are two that did pass and will be discussed at today's meeting, uh, adding octreotide and adding uh, in acetylcysteine. Uh, the drug profiles for octreotide and in acetylcysteine were also uh, reviewed and passed. Uh, we did table the discussion of the bylaws, um, and uh, we also reviewed the slides for rulemaking and next steps. Uh, that's it for PMD. Thank you. Uh, Julia, are you going to get the pages of update? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we did not have a quorum at the last TSIS meeting on July 20th, so the meeting was entirely informational. Um, David Harden provided an overview of the state transfer for COVID strategies, and then Adam provided updates on different resources available through the EMS controller program, including the FX heart seat card and the neonatal resuscitation <laughs> program, um, and shared the national pediatric writing assessment results. Um, Adam also asked for volunteers to help review the ADH authority guidelines for the school document, which is in progress. Um, and then lastly, she like to start the new process to put all these education work groups on the education committees. Uh, next for discussion and action items, if I can get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve the FTC meeting minutes from May 18th. Thank you. Second. Thanks, Ms. Amber. Thank you. 
If we can scroll through the meeting minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Any recommended amendments? Hearing none. Anyone opposed to the meeting minutes as displayed and shared in your packet, please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next, if I can get a motion to discuss amend and approve adding octreotide to table three, special agents eligible for administration and monitoring, uh, both table 3A, which is for interfacility transport, and table 3B, which is for in hospital setting. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Walter, and thanks for Dr. Rice. <laughs> Uh, so these were discussed at length at our PMD meeting, uh, but just wanted to see if there's any specific questions or feedback. This is the proposed drug table as it would appear. Any feedback from the group? All right, hearing none. Anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Stock Triotide has been approved for addition to table three A and D. I am unconscious in my seat. Please don't leave me, I'm taking with you. I have that. <laughs> All right. And uh, next agenda item, if I can get a motion to discuss amended approve, adding N and cetylcysteine to table three, uh, both for inner facility, which is 3A, and for in hospital use, which is 3B. So moved. Thank you. Uh, first from Dr. Walker, second from Dr. Bright. Uh, again, this was discussed at length. Uh, at PMD, uh, we had great input from Dr. O'Connor and uh, toxicology representatives on PMD as well. And also involved adding a star for investigation. Oh, thank you. And we have maybe uh, scroll down and highlight there. Any questions, comments, or feedback? All right, hearing none. Anyone opposed? Please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Excellent. So we have approved adding NS Filtisti to table 3A and 3B. Uh, next, we are going to review the provided drug profile. So if I can get a motion to discuss and then approve the drug profile for octreotide that is in your uh, in your packet. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Walter. I'm going to second Dr. Johnson. Uh, we did spend quite a bit of time um, I'm working on these drug profiles, SPMD, so I do have some notes if anyone has any questions. Let's see if there's any feedback. Again, the Bureau does try to provide these from educational perspective for uh, EMS medical directors and providers that may use these agents. Thank you. Uh, Brian, yes? Yeah. We don't have an alternative destination one rice. No. no. Oh, not yet. Exactly. There is not a good night during the whole What's that? Good night during the Oh, the octreal. Sorry. All right. Uh, hearing no feedbacks in the group, I guess team did an excellent, an excellent job, though. So. <laughs> uh, first. Anyone opposed to the drug profile as displayed, please say nay. 
Any abstention? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank aye. you. All right. Uh, next, if I can get a motion to discuss and amend approve the drug profile for N acetylcysteine. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Walter. I can come back to right. Thank you. Again, quite a bit of time spent on this at the uh, PMD committee. Any recommended amendments? All right, uh, hearing none, anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstention? All those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Thank you. And next, if I can get a motion to discuss and amend approved a draft T3G uh, guideline for alternative destination for behavioral health patients. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. First, can I get a second? Thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, just to give a little bit of background on this, uh, typically we do try to get things as much as possible through PMD for some screening uh, based on some finding of the work groups that we have out of PMS Council for alternative destination for behavioral health. Uh, one of the apps was to try to look at coming up with a guideline uh, due to the fact that PMD would not meet until November and this council wouldn't meet until January. We wanted to try to see if we could uh, get approval of this. So I just to give a heads up that this did not go through PMD, uh, only because we wanted to try to get this approved if the council agreed. Uh, this has been our sample uh, TTDG uh, for <laughs> the uh, alternative destination as part of our historic treatment refer that we've had available. Uh, we wanted to propose this as an option uh, that an EMS agency can adopt with the person from their medical director for screening of patients for alternative uh, destination to a behavioral health facility. Uh, so there are some specific uh, criteria on here regarding uh, patients greater than 50 or less than 18, uh, and then inclusion criteria, uh, some vital sign uh, criteria, blood glucose criteria, and then kind of delineating when you would transport to behavioral health facility uh, versus an emergency department. So uh, we can spend a little bit of time on this. I wanted to make sure that we uh, had adequate time for the group to review. Uh, so we'll kind of start at the top and see if anyone has any specific questions or comments. Yes, Brian. Um, I don't have 504 up on my phone at the moment, but it seems to me like it requires that one, uh, for an alternative destination, that it needs to be contacted and they need to agree to take the patient. And on here, if this patient is less than 18, contact online medical directions and receiving behavioral health facility. But I think you have to contact them by that rule um, in, in any situation under the rules. Um, down below, it says the patient should voluntarily agree to transfer to behavioral health facility. And I wonder if there should be perhaps more of a definition that they need to have appropriate decision-making capacity to be able to do that. Because there's a couple down here, substance abuse, alcohol, and drugs were, they might not have that decision-making capacity unless they're speaking only detox and they haven't had anything recently. And then, the other one, acute psychotic episode, would those people necessarily have decision-making capacity? So uh, I think there should be more of a description that they have to agree, but that means they have to be able to consent and there are requirements around that. So, Good point. In regards to acute psychosis, there are many patients with acute psychosis that maintain. Uh, they may be acutely hallucinating, but still able to answer capacity questions and have a decision making, but they may not be safe to be at home. Uh, so this is something that um, I think when we look at substance use, uh, many patients may be on, uh, have used or adjusted some type of uh, either alcohol or drugs to still maintain capacity. Uh, certainly we can include that language, although I think that is implied in terms of uh, making sure someone has capacity and that they're not altered. Uh, that's kind of one of the basic uh, inherent things that does need to be 
kind of stuff to the patient. You know, we use we used to use the e-cigarette vape devices may not be plugged into any power source while on board the airplane. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm I'm muting again. <laughs> For a number of years, a long time ago, we used the alternative destination rule to a couple of different places. And there were lots of issues about uh, some of those uh, some of those facilities uh, who did want to take patients who probably didn't have decision making capacity. And it was um, it was some work to get uh, to get around that because you know the rule doesn't describe decision making capacity it just says they have to have the choice <clears throat> and any, a lot of people could say yes i want to go there but they don't understand the consequences of what what might be going there versus so it just just the thought and then on the the contacting the behavioral health facility uh, before you take them there And I like the idea of contacting the behavioral health facility because that's something we've installed in our area because they may or may not have staffing at that time or bed available. And so then if you try it first without putting that in there, they end up at the facility, then they turn around and have to drive back to the ED. So a quick phone call. Makes yeah, we did one of our one of the facilities that we have dealt with in the past um, with like three or four different administrations all trying to make different rules about what they would take. Uh, started agreeing to to take uh, to take the patients, but then if they got there, uh, they would give them you know a breathalyzer test, and if they blew over two hundred, then they would refuse to take them. Um, so that actually kind of put an end to our participation in that at that point in time, um, because that didn't meet the intent of the rules. I don't think anyway. So, so I will uh, go to Dr. Cooper. I see your hand raised, and then I'll chime in, Dr. Cooper. Thank you. Um, just based on some of my experience, we might want to reconsider the upper limits of normal for the systolic blood pressure and the blood glucose. I think those things will end up actually excluding a fair amount of patients and bringing them to the ED. We're really not going to do anything to manage those numbers in the ED anyhow. Um, and I don't think that there's really risk for serious harm if we uh, expanded those numbers a little bit, but just something to consider maybe at least the systolic BP going up to at least 190 and the blood sugar at least 300. Um, just something to consider. I just feel like it might exclude a lot of people unnecessarily and they won't get any additional treatment by going to the ED. So, uh, you know, some feedback on those numbers, those numbers were, behavior, were provided by at least within Maricopa County behavioral health facilities for kind of their threshold of what they would accept and be able to manage without needing to call 911 secondarily. So that was historically where those numbers came from, um, was based on the feedback we got specifically from the behavioral health facilities. I, I do want to comment on the uh, the one aspect, you know, I appreciate what Brian's saying when you have facilities that maybe say bring us patients, but then we have very specific criteria. Uh, you know, one of the things from ACTA, uh, which I think they will reiterate next week as well, uh, and from Solari's perspective, too, is that they have the, what they call their no wrong door or crisis stabilization clinics. And those those clinics take patients uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week from law enforcement. And these patients have had no screening whatsoever. Uh, these are coming in directly from law enforcement. Uh, we did hear from one EMS agency who has had the experience for a number of years taking patients to that, those facilities. Those facilities don't really want a phone call, uh, but I recognize that those are very specific. And so that's something that may need to be delineated a little bit differently. Uh, but we do want to make sure we help keep uh, providers within rule. But at least the price of stabilization clinics, which are kind of access funded and run clinics, uh, those clinics will have a no wrong door policy, meaning they will take any patient at any time. I think it would be difficult to put in here something very specific, right. um, just because every single agency is going to have a different set of places that they could potentially transport to, and they're all going to have. I mean, every agency is going to need to reach out to their area to institute this and find out what. And you're right. I think so are. I would probably just have one line to use the same thing and add a line with the contact and your phone number for our area. So yeah. you wouldn't go to that same line. Yeah. So I think the goal of this is to really have, you know, at least provide an option for a kind of universal screening guide to make sure that we're not potentially taking patients, uh, but also making sure that we 
uh, recognize that each individual entity that tried to initiate a program like this will need to work with behavioral health facilities in your area to ensure that they are comfortable, willing, and able to receive patients. Uh, I do see uh, a couple questions in the chat. What is appropriate staffing if there's only a paramedic at the facility? I think that question, Tracy, I'm not quite sure what the question is referring to. Transfer of care? Because you have to transfer to a paramedic or higher transfer of care if you're a paramedic. So it could be paramedic or higher, so yeah. still paramedic. The, yeah. the rule, the rule, that question has come up and e an EMT can take it. The facility has identified was appropriate to, to take the patient. That was a big question about that concept of downgrading to a lower level of care and the rule, and the rule should address that, that you can do that. Uh, and I can see Dr. Cooper's comment uh, regarding the uh, blood pressure, blood sugar readings, and uh, de definitely we can ask agencies to try to track if they get declined because of certain parameters. Uh, Dr. Walter? Just a thought on the uh, temperature, and uh, I heard uh, what you said, Gail, that you know, typically throughout Maricopa County, uh, this was the threshold for 101 Fahrenheit. But uh, again, uh, SIRS uh, uses different criteria, 100.4 or you know, less than 36 Celsius. So just a, a thought, uh, um, I'll defer the wisdom of the group, but maybe a lower limit, uh, and maybe the upper limit's a bit high. Uh, but uh, as you said, some facilities uh, will just take anyone and uh, sort it out thereafter. And I think, you know, one of the things that was brought up when this was first developed was just that, especially for someone who uh, may be unhoused, if they're outside in Arizona, their baseline temperature is probably sitting uh, close to that 101 if they're outside. Uh, and so recognizing, especially during you know, warm and summer months, we may really exclude a large volume of patients who aren't actually febrile, but just are kind of having more minor heat exposure. So uh, I, I agree definitely, hopefully we would capture those patients with a true fever with the other vital time parameters. Thank you. So uh, just to clarify, is there a request to adjust the verbiage at the top about uh, contacting receiving behavioral health facility, or does the group feel that that should be up to the individual agency and medical director to make sure that it aligns with the resources in their area? Second one, okay. <laughs> so uh, at the top where we have the lesson 18, you wanna just keep that as contact online medical direction? I think any agency that implements this program definitely will need to work with the facilities that are in their area to ensure that that facility can take certain age groups and see what method of the communication they want before transfer to their facility. Like in our area, we have this under 18 exclusion because we don't have a heat intake. So if it's under 18, they automatically come to the ED. So. Any further discussion, questions, comments? Sorry, Gail, I have one more question and, and maybe it's a comment at the very bottom and I can't see it anymore. Um, there's a list of uh, patients that should be transported to an emergency department. Um, that doesn't include all the patients that are excluded in here. Um, it seems like that's probably not necessary and to avoid uh, creating a vague area, we could just eliminate the transport to emergency department group altogether in that bottom right hand box. Okay. Uh, and maybe should we just beef up the known or suspected toxic ingestion and kind of put in that second bullet? Yeah, but they're they're excluded from this protocol above. Uh -huh. uh, so I just consistency wise, I, I don't, I was wondering why you would put these down here if you don't put pregnant greater than 20 weeks or any of the other things above. Got it. I, you know, I think the way this was originally was designed with a case that would miss that, but I think we can certainly, I see your point of making it more clear that that's an exclusion, don't go further. Uh, so moving that, I think we can expand that any known or suspected toxic ingestion. 
uh, we can just say any known or suspected uh, ingestion of over-the-counter prescription or liquid substances. So just moving that bullet up, does that address that one? Yeah, I think so. And then we have, we already have, as you pointed out, combative such as violence, and maybe we should just move violent, violent, agitated, or combative, and then medication we have addressed above as well. So, yeah, I could, could pick up on that. So, oh, and just one other thought on that too. Um, it may be not just ingestion as a route, it may be injection or inhalation. So, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, there, there could be more inclusive terminology. Uh, you could say if you want ingestion, comma, injection, comma, or inhalation, um, or uh, any uh, known or suspected uh, drug toxicity, uh, and bring up the verbiage from below due to prescription over-the-counter or other uh, um, substances, make it even more general. Uh, yeah, because it may not be a medication, it may not be a drug. Uh, it could be like paint uh, sniffer, huffer, or something like that. Yeah, I think you know, looking at this, I think the the known or suspected toxic is actually makes a little bit uh, more over the counter. Because when we talk about illicit, illicit thing gets into well, so much of fentanyl. Um, that probably could be a patient that is able to go <laughs> to behavioral disability. So it probably is not a good one to include. Uh, so maybe clarifying any, any known or suspected, um, in, you know, toxic or over-the-counter prescription. So I think yeah. it's really... Oh, or you can just say toxic exposure. If you want to be, uh, you know, if you want a, a very wide open terminology to include any uh, or all of the above, uh, if people would understand uh, toxic exposure um, or overdose. So the last, uh, at the bottom of the, the last uh, box would essentially be across the whole, I would be transport to behavioral facility and we'd have kind of those categories of patients. Uh, and then we'll clean up the verbiage uh, regarding the combative and violence and uh, the ingestions. That's fine. That's Chad, Barb, Adams. Do you want to just like the intentional ingest or like over intentional overdose? That so you're trying to separate someone who might have used drugs versus someone who it's tried to harm themselves, right? Or toxic from something. I, I don't know that intent matters if they're intoxicated or poisoned. Um, it, uh, uh, the medical condition would supersede their psychiatric condition and necessitate transport to a medical facility. Even in know, or, or an emergency department specifically. Right Obviously, psychiatric facilities are medical too. Yeah, I think that from my experience, they've been bounced from the behavioral health facility back to the ED if they've intentionally overdosed so that they could get the other blood work, ketaminophen and sort of the other blood work levels, and then they'll go back if there's an intentional ingestion of something or an intentional overdose. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Amber. Yeah, in, intentional or or even unintentional, we see a lot of people unintentionally overdose. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I agree. It could be intentional or unintentional. I'm trying to figure out how best to capture that because I'm just thinking if you accidentally took, accidentally took hence acetaminophen versus intentionally taking it, either way, you need to go to the emergency department. So I think either category, you still need to have that medical clearance for safety. But I don't know where the intent would help that category of patient if it's an ingestion. Yeah, I, I, my suggestion is any known or suspected toxic uh, exposure, um, and then you don't have to address intent or non-intent. You don't have to ingest route. Um, but, but again, people may not understand it unless we're more explicit. 
I bought it with the group on it. So uh, what about any notice effects of toxic exposure in parentheses over the counter uh, prescription or other toxins? Yeah, um, I would say or other poisons. Or other poisons. Okay. Or other substances, actually, I would suggest. And the reason is toxins have a real specific uh, definition of something poisonous from the metabolism of a living organism. It's, it's commonly used in a more generic sense, but um, it's, it's not, uh, we wouldn't want it here. If we use, I'm kind of trying to think through this from a provider perspective, if we use the term substances, are they gonna think, well, this person used methamphetamine as a substance? Uh, so that would be an exclusion. I just want to make sure as we kind of words so that we have lots of time, so we get to everything else yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> I, I, I guess I guess the point is the effect. Do they appear <laughs> under the influence of an intoxicating? Uh, you know, are they poison? Um, so um, obviously the intentionality if they're suicidal. I think we got that covered already. Um, but, um, if, if they have an effect from what they've done, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, quote unquote, coming from medical clearance because they've either, uh, taken an overdose that could be serious or they already appear intoxicated or poisoned. Um, uh, if they, that, that's the issue, I, I think. Um, so, you know, uh, any known or suspected uh, toxic ingestion or, or um, you know, you could put inhalation or injection. Uh, that would cover most of the uses. Uh, maybe uh, we should just revert to that. I like that wording, I think, the best because I don't think that it has so much to do with them being under the influence, but that they've taken something potentially toxic. Yeah. I like that. So say the verbiage again. <laughs> basically, we're just adding comma in just or just in comma uh, injection or inhalation. Yeah. Any known or suspected toxic exposure, ingestion, or inhalation? Ingestion, comma injection, comma or inhalation. It covers the three major routes that most people use either medications or drugs of abuse or substances of abuse. What do you think about including in parentheses includes OTC and prescription medication? I think those are the ones that often are the most dangerous that people. I'm fine with that. If you think it helps, sure. You could put OTC comma prescription comma and um, do you want to address uh, drugs of abuse? Uh, you know, illicit and, and illegal are, or uh, I just, I capture things like Tylenol over there. Yeah, I think or, you know they're not symptomatic, but they're sick. Yeah, right, right. The over the counter and uh, and prescription cover it. Do you want to cover other um, things that aren't over the counter or prescription or not? I don't think so for that one, just because I think we might exclude a lot more patients that may be very appropriate. I I can I can live with that, no problem. Yes. Uh, I do see in the chat uh, from Barb Schaefer, you could add positive decision-making capacity with a bullet on the patient should voluntary agree to transfer. But screws progress on adding that verbiage. Unless you say, most of agree, make an informed decision. Just let it pass both, just so you could do patient should have positive decision making capacity and voluntarily agree to transfer to vehicles. So you want to include that. Patient should have, uh, so uh, the recommendation is uh, the bullet that is in the first uh, large box would be 
a patient should have the decision making capacity and voluntarily agree to transfer to behavioral health facility. I, I like that verbiage better. I, I'm not sure if positive decision making capacity indicates the quality of it in that it's a good decision, a positive decision. <laughs> It is a very good grammar pickup. It's like where you put that comma, right? It's important. <laughs> so yes, I mean, this. I like that verbiage. The patient should um, have decision making capacity and voluntarily agree to transfer to behavioral health facility. I like it. Uh, do your update, Barb. Thank you. Any other recommended amendments? Pardon? <laughs> All right, sharing none. Anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstention? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next up is any agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. Oh, Mr. Uh, Walter, do you have a question? Uh, just a, a thought. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we've all voted and, uh, and I'm okay with that. Just thinking of the first line, more or less, on the octreotide, there's a word gastroenterohepatic. And uh, it just kind of jumped out at me, and it may be just me. Um, uh, not familiar with that term, but I've Googled it. Uh, I went on drug bank and also daily med, uh, just two real quick online sources looking for a mechanism of action or pharmacodynamics. So, um, it's just an odd word to me and, and PMDs worked really hard on it. So maybe it's just the right word. Any comments on that for those who crafted that, if you wish to entertain that. It's just it's just a wording issue. It has nothing to do with whether we should approve it or not. It was on the drug profile for octreotide. I'm, I'm going back to my notes. Just she she in and directs gastroenterotactic. Yeah, I'm wondering if that was the it was a typo. I think it might be, but it's a big gap. I didn't mention it right away because I wanted to go searching and uh, not bring up a non-issue, but uh, I. When you Google that, no, nothing pops up. Uh, not that that's the ultimate arbiter, <laughs> but but also that kind of terminology does uh, pop up in NIH, National Library of Medicine, Daily Med, or a drug bank either. So sorry for bringing it up now, but. Oh, it is a good pickup. We're going to make sure before we publish this, we're not using a term that does not exist. And we did not discuss that uh, specific word. I went back to my notes. I discussed everything else. <laughs> robot, but not that term. Uh, from a, uh, can we go back on the agenda and quickly think that, or just a, it's a typo. It's a typo. Yeah. Okay, typo. Would you fix it? Yeah, I'll do an administrative change on that word. All right, so it's a recommendation for administrative change to gap to her paddock, Dr. Walter? Um, whatever, uh, um, I'm not going to suggest a specific word there, but that's just not the right word. Okay, would it be uh, gastrointestinal peptides? That's yeah, like they are gastrointestinal peptides. Yeah, I can, okay. yeah, that uh, that's probably a much better terminology. Probably gastrointestinal and hepatic. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know that hepatic adds anything, and there's some. Um, um, I 
I can just put it in the chat. Whatever PMD wants is fine with me. Uh, they can correct it as, as they wish. And maybe it's best offline since it's just a typo. Well, it sounds like gastrointestinal is at least a correct terminology. Yeah, the absolutely. Way. Yeah, All that's, right. that's fine. <laughs> All right. I will take that as a friendly uh, amendment as a typo. I agree. A quick Google search. I'm not finding that either. So thank you for capturing that. Sure. And sorry for my delay, but I wanted to double check too. No, I appreciate that. Good to have sure. Uh, next, any agenda items to be taken for the next? Oh, oops, I, I skipped my law. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead. It's so exciting. <laughs> All right. Uh, there are a few uh, recommended amendments to the bylaws that we wanted to go through. Uh, the bylaws do need to get reviewed every three years, so we wanted to make sure we went through those. Uh, the recommended amendments are highlighted in red in your pockets. Uh, you will see. Uh, on page two, there's a review request for pilot uh, study slash project. This has been the process the Bureau has implemented. We wanted to officially add that to the bylaws. Under terms of membership, there's two items that were added. Uh, the first was term of membership. Members of the commission are appointed by the governor for three-year terms or until that position is filled or replaced, whichever is later. We recognize that sometimes people have a term that expires, uh, but they stay sit on the committee so much longer. So we wanted to make sure we could capture that. Uh, we also included the uh, two requirements to sit in a public uh, uh, meeting, which is the loyalty oath as well as Law 2000, which is public service orientation training. This is required as part of this public meeting. Uh, next recommendation was voting by email should not be authorized. This was a, another recommendation from uh, the public meeting uh, workers that Shelley went to. And then the last one on page four is members must be able to communicate their attendance by a voice chat or in person. We had had some issues where it was unclear if a member was actually present for a meeting. We want to make sure that we follow our public meeting rules. And so we wanted to add that to the agenda so it was very clear. So those are the recommended amendments to the bylaws. If I can get a motion to approve, please. So moved. Thank you. First and the second, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Wright. Thank you. Any discussion or feedback on this recommended amendment? And Sherry, none. Anyone opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor say aye. 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 I saw your hand raised on the, on the computer, Dr. Walter. Thank you. Uh, next. Uh, any agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. If there's anything you would like covered, you could either uh, let us know in this meeting or you can email either myself or Shelly. We will make sure to add that to the next agenda. Next is call to the public. Uh, next is uh, upcoming events. There's a list of upcoming events on the uh, agenda for today. Uh, in addition, on the Bureau's website, we have a news and conferences page and a training programs page, which includes a large number of training opportunities. Our next meeting will be January 24th at, I'm sorry, it says January 2024, but what, was <laughs> what is the actual date? <laughs> the 12th. Okay. January 24th, 2024. Uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, we will have a hybrid format once again. And if I can get a motion to adjourn. Thank you. A meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you all.